It had been one of those glorious early June days, so bright and clear it should have made the world feel alive with the promise of summer, relaxing and warm but not too hot. During normal times, it would have been an ideal day to curl up on my back deck with a book and a glass of wine. But times weren't normal. They hadn't been since the news that a strange and unknown illness was sweeping India, and odds were good they never would be again. Not in my lifetime, anyway. It had all changed so fast. The virus sweeping the globe and killing 90% of those infected, and civilization slipping away, followed by endless nothingness. Then the monsters. Yes, monsters. I still couldn't believe it. In the passenger seat, Liv sat in stoic silence as I drove, her expression pinched. Her dark, wavy hair was piled on top of her head in a messy bun, and her face was clean of makeup, making her look young and fresh, yet somehow mature at the same time. It was how she acted, too, bouncing between moments of maturity that impressed me and emotional outbursts that reminded me she was only 14 years old and still so young and impulsive and reckless. She had been so very reckless. Nearly 20 hours had passed since I'd realized she'd stolen her father's car to go look for her best friend, Kendall, but the panic that squeezed my insides whenever I glanced her way hadn't disappeared completely. It had been like my worst nightmare coming true, especially considering the state of things. As an author of apocalyptic fiction, I understood the kind of threat people could present at the end of the world, knew how dangerous they could be, and the horrible things they were capable of. And that was without the added danger of huge-ass monsters. Yes, my daughter had been so very reckless. Memories of the horror from the night before taunted me as I drove, sending a shiver shooting down my spine that intensified when I passed a house with a mound of disturbed dirt in the front yard. It was recent, and the hole was huge, probably bigger than the one we'd seen the night before and the dirt fresh and moist, telling me one of those things was most likely sleeping there at this very moment. I shuddered again and gripped the steering wheel tighter. How could this be happening? Obviously noticing the hole as well, Grayson slowed the truck he was driving, which forced me to move my foot to the brake. My mini decelerated, and behind me, the burgundy van Sean was driving followed suit. The sun's glare on its windshield prevented me from getting a good look inside, but I was sure they were staring at the yard as well. The disturbed area was impossible to miss. I'd almost been able to convince myself the beasts weren't nearly as big as my memories from the night before had made them seem. But the sight of the hole shattered the delusion. The thing was massive, six feet across at least, which matched what I remembered about the giant's size. Three to four times bigger than the average man, they had thighs as thick as tree trunks and arms that bulged with muscle. With no body hair or genitals, they barely looked human anymore, especially considering their lack of eyes, nose, and ears. Their mouths were huge, taking up a good portion of their faces, and gaped open so wide it looked like they could literally bite a person's head off, and their fang-like teeth only added to the impression, while their black, snakish tongues made them even more terrifying. Basically, they were the stuff of nightmares, except this was one dream we couldn't wake up from.